Thank you, um, Peter, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, actually. When, I, when Peter told me what he was trying to do here, I sort of jumped at it and I said, okay, let's see if we can somehow juggle the schedule and so that I can join you. Because obviously can this is, something? yes, of course. If you don't walk into the screen, that uh, recording is doing better. Uh, are you saying I should get out of the limelight? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, well, it's a GoPro, so it probably has a nice range. Uh, oh, the big one behind, that, that one can see everything. So, as I say, it's a great pleasure to be here and also reconnect to the core community. It is responsible for a great deal, and I think you will probably um, understand after my speech just how much this core community of researchers and music technologists has contributed to the entire Horizon Europe program, not just to the calls that you apply to, um, and not just to the activities, and there were uh, really many uh, listed earlier today, um, that were really wide reaching. They weren't only for about music uh, technology, it, it, it impacts on human interaction in all kinds of ways, and it spans domains. It is actually one of the unique fields that is able to span domains for some very good reasons, which I think will be become apparent in my talk. I'm very also very happy to hear, and I did mention when we had coffee this morning, there are so many ladies present uh, here. Um, I very often get faced with uh, uh, a room full of men when it comes to these kinds of topics and uh, it's very refreshing and v uh, for me it's a huge welcome to the ladies in the room. Uh, the perspectives that you can bring to the table are incredibly important uh, and this is something else that I think you will probably notice uh, when I speak. I'm in a very unusual situation. I advise the European Commission for, well I've been advising to the European Commission since 2013-14 on the Connect Advisory Forum uh, initially, and which was uh, um, basically uh, doing all the recommendations for the Horizon program, and, uh, uh, and then later to the G7 leaders as well, uh, and now into several DGs, uh, actually across, across the board. And uh, what's really unusual, particularly um, uh, for the domain that we're talking about and for the activity is that I am uniquely positioned to be able to feed policy directly from the grassroots experimentation with technology. So direct interaction, um, making assumptions, testing them, test driving them, collaborating on solutions, and then seeing the results both from the process of, of, of innovation um, and research and uh, also from uh, what kind of results and in what kind of domains we can penetrate with those. So. Uh, this is a very unusual situation because most policy advisors are either lobbyists representing particular companies or they uh, represent particular organizations, they have a remit and they don't tend to be hands-on uh, with um, uh, testing uh, assumptions. So this has uh, ended up with me informing all of the innovation agenda, so hence on the screen behind me you get our uh, Commissioner for Innovation 2014-19, to 19, Carlos Muedas, and what I will do is I will immerse you first into some of our breakthroughs. Peter has kindly asked me to talk you through my research trajectory. Uh, it is rather long, it's over 25 years long, um, but um, uh, so we would be here for, for a long time if I were to go through the whole thing. But I want to immerse you into some breakthroughs and then we'll just backtrack a bit and just see where that came from and what happened since. And this was one of the breakthroughs. This was a moment where we hooked Carlos Muedas uh, with neurofeedback sensors and we sonified his uh, brain output and uh, visualized it for the benefit of 700 VIPs, including Nobel laureates. Um, we, um, we basically visualized and sonified his brain activity during question time. Not many politicians would agree to do such a thing live and this is of course very much an experiment it wasn't a polished and tested technology we very much work with things that are half baked and in fact very often what happens as a result is they veer off in a different research direction to what the researcher originally intended um, but he was asked some mathematical questions and he actually did rather well because <laughs> he's an engineer but I would kind of um, I often sort of wonder if you were to hook up some politicians nowadays some other politicians whether we would see and um, what activity we would see there 
Um, so this was one of the opportunities when we literally disrupted. This was in Parliament, um, and the uh, the whole event was about the future of uh, European research and innovation. So it was uh, 2017, a big discussion about the Horizon Europe program. So this was the moment. Um, this was Obama picking us as one of the future technology frontiers when he guest edited Wired magazine in uh, in his last month of presidency, November 2016, if I'm correct, 2016, yes, that's right. And, uh, and uh, 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 this was a complete surprise. Uh, we really didn't um, uh, expect anything like this, so we usually just get on with our stuff, we just, uh, we just do what we do. Um, but then, um, uh, at this point, our community had grown to over 5,000, and uh, I decided that we needed a role model, and uh, uh, the uh, piece uh, was a one-page piece that featured, as one of the Future Technology Frontiers uh, Music Tech Fest, and its um, role model, Victoria Modesta. This is Victoria Modesta. I hope you can see it with the, with the light reflection on here. Um, Victoria is a futurist. She's a fellow of MIT now. Um, she is someone who is not afraid to challenge preconceptions, and she's a performance artist and very interested in technology. Um, currently, I think, uh, in a sci-fi series on one of the major American networks, so, so an actress. Um, a really great performer. And uh, when, um, when Victoria joined us for our labs, when I asked her, would you be our role model? I needed a, a role model that was female. Um, that was not afraid to use new technologies, that was really happy to be the advocate for new kinds of performance, new kinds of modes of expression. And that also challenged preconceptions in every possible way in terms of um, how we perceive human beings, what they can do, how we classify them, how we name them, how we kind of call them. Like we say, some people are more able than others, etc. And I can challenge that and I will show you how we challenge that. Um, when she joined our labs, the first thing we did was, okay, well, you know, this prosth prosthetic leg doesn't have to be, um, um, and it shouldn't be, um, sort of a classic Otto Bock uh, pink uh, rubber thing that's trying to replicate a kind of leg. Um, it can be anything, and to, to begin with, uh, this leg was uh, fitted, uh, she was fitted with a carbon fiber outfit with sensors, and she was able to express herself by creating smoke for the stage, so her leg was creating smoke for the stage, or rather the rest of her dress, if you like. And why not? Because this was just another means for expression for her on stage. So of course, on stage we have all kinds of props and ways in which artists enhances their performance, and this was just one of them. So here was a statement that was saying, okay, what we have is a tool, and what we can do is enhance uh, the ability for a human um, uh, to express themselves in completely new ways. But we wanted to take this further, so we fitted her with neurofeedback sensors and then she spent a week in the labs, uh, we, we do week-long labs, uh, training uh, to express herself directly from her brain, uh, to change the colors of her dress depending on the mood she wanted to express. So just to put it super simplistically, if the mood was blue, maybe the t dress would turn blue. Um, so LED fitted dress and then um, she took a few days to train but be en by the end of that process she was able to express herself seamlessly. She was able to sing, dance, perform, use all kinds of environmental devices and express her mood through the color. It wasn't pre-cooked, it was coming directly from her expression and it really worked. So we thought we would take this further. Um, incidentally, this is a still from the MIT uh, video that they made about us. So uh, these are MIT students that Joy Ito sent over, and then we have a winner of the Hungarian Video, video Awards up there. This was after the event. Um, we have uh, someone who was working with Ars Electronica at the time over there. So um, a really wonderful uh, group of people, and in this particular shot, they're all women. And our labs immediately went to 50% women. Um, so we are very, very proud of that. And we have analysis, we have figures, we can show you that when it comes to technological innovation, if you involve creativity, we do get those numbers of women. Um, and that, uh, put it, to put it simplistically, women are motivated by uh, their goal. They tend to be, and this is, there's a sliding scale in gender, I will not accept anything else. So on one hand, let's say we have a very, very um, 
uh, focused uh, guy who likes to play with technology until something interesting happens. On the other side, we have a very goal-oriented woman who has ideas of what she wants to achieve, but she doesn't know how to. And then she's happy to learn it whichever way she, she can from other people around her. Now, there's a whole range in between, of course. Um, uh, but this is uh, why when we open it up to these kinds of realms of possibilities of working in different ways, we get this kind of great results and we get all the talent in the room. So as I say, we wanted to take things forward. And so what we decided, we went to Slush, we were invited by Slush in 2016. I was invited to open the new music track at Slush. So I did a keynote where I showed uh, what actually the impact of music research is on the world in general and on NASDAQ and I was able to prove it. I actually looked at the figures that existed and I, I made, I posited sort of uh, uh, basically a thesis that um, m the biggest companies in the world are driven by interaction with music to a great extent and we were able to show how. Then the following year they said, okay, what would you like to do? I said, well, we'll run our five-day lab before Slush and then we can open Slush with completely new kinds of ways of interacting that had just been done in the previous five days. And this is what we, uh, we did. With the neurofeedback, uh, there were was, there was so many projects uh, uh, that, that were involved in this. Uh, uh, there were 30 people collaborating on various different projects. But the neurofeedback uh, thing is particularly interesting. So uh, I will just play our teaser. This is what happens when you have, when you've tested everything. in advance and then when it comes to it doesn't want to kick off there we go now it does so you're hearing Rika Haninen she is Sibelius Institute vocal coach fabulous fabulous uh, talented singer huge range um, she's a blind singer very proud to be so This is all part of the lab, so people experimenting both on themselves and uh, with uh, technologies. And what we decided to do was to, um, this time, we decided to adapt a system from clinical trials. So this was the, uh, the premise for it. We decided to adapt a system for clinical trials um, that um, that uh, allows you to um, train people with anxiety. So when, uh, this is incidentally, this particular shot and it's rather dark, I'm not sure if you can see it. This is when we hooked up the audience to Rika's pulse because the first thing she said to us was, um, and sometimes, sometimes, uh, the technologies you apply are super simple and they have a huge effect. This is also worth remembering. The first thing she said to us was, well, actually what I need on stage is, I don't know how the audience is feeling. I can't see them when I sing. So the first thing we did was just hook uh, audience with pulse sensors. And at Slush, you know, you have all these investors and startups, so you think they're gonna be too busy to worry about this and they don't, they won't gonna wanna get involved. And we had a rush for the stage, it was like a rock and roll moment. Everybody wanted to be hooked up for pulse. And then she was able to have a dialogue with the audience. But on the neurofeedback front, my videos are not uh, kicking off as they should, here we go. Uh, on the neurofeedback front, the system for clinical trials for anxiety works like this. Uh, you tend to visualize the brain activity and you get the patient to monitor the brain activity so that when the pattern changes and the pattern, the onslaught of an anxiety attack happens before, the symptoms show before the person is aware. When the pattern starts to change, the person realizes that there's a pattern changes and they can start to train to control it. This also is practice in psychology. Now, did the exact same thing except the person was able to play music instead. So they were able to train to play music instead by looking at the feedback, visual feedback. And it was taking around two hours for people in the lab to train to be able to go up and down the musical scale. And then this miracle happened when Rika, the blind singer, put the neurofeedback uh, reader on and she was able to play instantly, without training. And suddenly everybody in the room stopped and went, what just happened? The, the neuroscientists went, we've never seen this before. 
And of course, what we had uncovered was that someone who in the mechanical era would have been considered less able-bodied because her lack of vision prevented her from operated machinery. Suddenly, this person in the era of brain-computer interfaces was far more talented than the rest of us. So, this is when I say that, you know, we have breakthroughs. This is a visualization of uh, Rika's uh, brain activity as she is uh, commanding the system directly from her brain, as well as using all kinds of other accessibility devices that were developed for her uh, during the live, live performance. And of course, this was done for the benefit of the audience, and it was directly responsive to what was happening, so you couldn't have, again, uh, uh, done a canned demo of this. Where does this come from? Um, well, so as I say, I will just run quickly through a uh, trajectory. Uh, this is me last year at the Museum of Modern Art, um, uh, at the exhibition of my father's work. I grew up with my father, who's a well-known architect, around, in fact, this zone here, and uh, uh, was. He passed away in 2013, and uh, uh, this was a very acclaimed exhibition. I'm super proud of him, but uh, I was trained from a very early age, and <laughs> when people don't believe me, that we have actually documentation where I'm written into projects as a technical assistant at the age of 10 and from the age of 10 <laughs> onwards. So when I actually ended up later, uh, you know, I was working on systems and, uh, in, in architecture. When I later studied design at the Royal College of Art, I, I, I focused on system design, particularly for initially media. So I created a newspaper for digital age and I got headhunted by the Financial Times. So I ended up with... Uh, uh, several years of uh, reinventing uh, newspapers and how they worked and how they um, uh, were published and uh, designed and put together, etc. And then uh, I ended up being headhunted by Apple when I got into uh, designing systems for effectively big data because at the FT I was working with big data a lot. We had a stream of big data coming in and we had to, in very, very short time, sift through all of this and make sense of it and do something meaningful with it. And it was a nightmare because there were no d big data systems. And so I took it on myself. I actually had some ideas. I took it on myself to actually sit down and program because I never had problems with maths or physics or any of those uh, subjects. So I was uh, able to, and my father is also an engineer, um, the, 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 the picture you saw earlier, that, that held the record for the biggest um, unsupported arch for 10 years of that kind of building, so uh, very, very used to engineering. And so I created this uh, precursor for CoverFlow for Apple, which then later became CoverFlow, so a system for flicking through images and uploading things in real time in 2003 when uh, half of Europe, everything south of Paris was on 56K modems, if you can imagine that. Um, and uh, my co-founder, of, of uh, so we are both graduates of the Royal College of Art, my co-founder went on to the design of the first iPhone over with Jonathan Ivan. He, he, he stayed there. They wanted me to stay as well, but I, I got too passionate about music information retrieval. Um, and uh, um, that's him there in the Apple patenting ecosystem. Absolutely huge uh, portfolio. Um, and uh, he worked on the original Newton, and with this, this, this particular Newton you haven't seen before, because it's not published out there. This was designed by Ross Lovegrove Studio, so when Peter was there, he was working on this with Johnny Ive, who was not at that time at all in the position he then became later, in, this was 96. And uh, if you look at what happened here, of course you probably know the story of the Newton, and the reason why at that time it was a visionary, uh, product, but it didn't have the infrastructure that would sort of make it a market uh, uh, product. Uh, the language of this, however, translated directly to the IMAX of, at the turn of the millennium. And so you can see that uh, this fancy uh, sort of um, uh, mass market computer that came out that made Apple sort of something that was at the forefront of everybody's minds actually came out of some of the early experimentation. So sometimes some of the vision and some of the technology filters through in other ways and actually makes another product really successful. And this is something that we've observed over and over again. This is our futures concepts for Nike, which we worked on in 99 and in two one 2001, 2003 as a one of the small studios that were cherry picked from Nike around the world. And we did seven concepts and five out of seven came out later in various different ways. But I was too passionate. I, I, when I was in Cupertino, I said to them, I said, look, guys, I mean, you are selling music as a spreadsheet. I mean, you know, music is an expressive cultural form. 
Um, it requires a, a, a rich uh, a palette of, of expressiveness, of, of tools that can express it. And so they said, yes, but we have trouble changing a background color currently. It takes us two weeks to do that. So, and we have, eight, uh, we have two people taking care of marketing for 88 countries. So there was no way they were going to be able to take this kind of thing on. And so I decided that I was going to do it anyway. So I got uh, invited by OMRAS, Online uh, Music Information Research, uh, by the University of London. They saw some of the interfaces I had been doing and um, they invited me to join in on an EPSRC grant. And this kind of started me on this journey with MIR. And this was, uh, my, my remit was um, that aside from all these kind of clients that I was working with, that I would also make sure that the project got into SIGGRAPH. And I got into SIGGRAPH immediately with this project, which then ended up uh, responsible for all kinds of things. I will let you um, hear a little bit of a uh, uh, recorded demo. Um, I seems to want to... Every video it seems to be delayed. Here we go. That's a dialogue between um, China and Ireland. So the, the system was working with first with Cantometrics library, so in ethnomusicology, and then also with um, the global collection of uh, 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 real world. And it turned out that basically there were lots of uh, features, uh, cultural features that were similar across dif different world cultures. And uh, of course, uh, it is a phenomenal social glue because music actually tra traverses boundaries, cultural boundaries uh, before language and before any other kind of custom does. Uh, so it's a wonderful cultural connector. This was at the, uh, exhibited at the one of the future um, British innovation during the London Olympics together with Airbus and um, British Aerospace and this uh, McLaren or something uh, ridiculous. So it was it was really weird where it got me. It got me into SIGGRAPH immediately. It got uh, me headhunted by the European Commission and hence where um, where uh, this kind of story started. So uh, some of you may be familiar with the mu uh, Roadmap for Music Information Research. When I got headhunted by the European Commission was because I was put forward for an the fir they did a f Art Meet Science Award in Barcelona. I had no idea the European Commission was behind it. I ended up getting it, but I ended up getting asked to come to Brussels. And they thought that this way of, um, uh, it add, uh, uh, this way of connecting the un or understanding from global audiences with the results of research um, was actually really important. And therefore, they wanted me to look at how we can open this wonderful field of MIR, which was at that point doing uh, really important work, um, to culture, to society. And you saw the, uh, the, the, the sort of map of it earlier. Now, uh, as part and parcel of it, I'm so fabulous people on it. Um, and I really enjoyed every moment of working on this. Um, we ended up getting uh, Xavier Serra to be the coordin administrative coordinator and me as a scientific coordinator. And it was a very close cooperation then with Gerhard Widmer and uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, Mark Sandler and with uh, um, uh, uh, Ugh Vinay. So all of the, all of the uh, great people from the, from the field. Um, what happened as a result, however, was very surprising. At one point I said, um, uh, I want to put artists and scientists and academia and industry in a, s in a space of common understanding. And I was told that uh, this is not going to happen because there has been tried and it never worked. And I just went, right, I, I've been working both in education and with students and postgraduate degree. And I know that the best environment is when we get diff diverse set of minds in one room and when they start to really appreciate each other's understanding and each other's knowledge from different domain viewpoints. And I knew how to do that, and I was going to try. This idea of having a couple of little workshops exploded into a three-day festival 
in a space of two months. I went to 60 different uh, 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 stakeholders, I'd say, um, from anything from, you know, BBC, R&D and DMI to Spotify or Shazam, all the new guys on the block to uh, all the academic uh, partners. And uh, it, it was 500 people in the end and uh, a huge amount of creative people, huge amount of um, uh, wonderful hands-on prototyping. Uh, we had to get extra additional funding. Um, I always end up in these situations where when something explodes, I have to actually go and sustain it somehow from additional sort of funding. So this, this uh, is a, a bit of a phenomenon um, because it continued to be a phenomenon and a community that rose. This has been now, um, uh, this is us at the London Symphony Orchestra in London. We've run 18 uh, labs and uh, uh, different size events across the world. So if just as a, uh, you know, the, the, the there are so many projects here, we could be for days talking about them just to illustrate the point in just in 2014, we did Wellington and New Zealand. Um, we were inside MIT and Microsoft Research in Cambridge in May. Uh, so that was MTF Boston, London Symphony Orchestra in London, uh, Centre Pompidou, or rather ECAM in Paris, and a factory in Berlin. And just London had 90 projects. And you just imagine coordinating this community. At this point, it had gone over 5,000, um, uh, was going to four, over 4,000 people. And then it went over five, and now it's over seven. So um, this is a classic example of uniting art and science. And uh, I think the easiest way is if you, uh, for every video, it wants me to go back one and forward one, so I do apologize for some reason. This is from 2014. This is us at Erkam. Shame that Frederick is not here. He was part of this. The boys called me the towering inferno, but perhaps because the headmaster was also a pipe smoker. <laughs> So, I will run you through some impacts. Culturally speaking, this is us in <laughs> Wellington in New Zealand. And this is guys coming with these instruments and saying, can you hack into those? Because they just witnessed someone had hacked into a didgeridoo, blocked it with a mini speaker on one end, fed, uh, fed synthesized sound through it, it double amplified as a result, and then they were beatboxing with it or another. It was a completely new instrument. And it was fabulous. And so they said, right, Please do these now, you know, and they're like these incredible carved centuries old things. You go like, you don't want to kind of start to, 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 to fit sensors on them because you're worried about uh, uh, ruining them. But this bridging between different cultures is fabulous. Then inventing the idea of gunk, geek punk. This is, um, so Holger Grossman from Fraunhofer brought um, uh, 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 the guy from um, uh, uh, Lou Edmonds from Public Image Limited. And he had hacked a two ethnic guitars, one, is one part is Turkish. And then someone had hacked into Wiimotes. And uh, there was a 3D printer on drums. And this is 8 o'clock on a Saturday night in the London Symphony Orchestra. And I thought, this is going to be such a cacophony, I'm going to get so embarrassed. And the audience will hate it. And they had practiced that afternoon. You know, it's, it takes some courage to do this. And then the audience loved it. And it turned out what they loved was the immediacy of expression. They had a dialogue with what was on stage. They could understand what was happening. It was a completely different situation. 
Artistic recognition happened. You saw Miriam Bleu there. Uh, I put her as a headliner in, 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 in Paris, and then she, was, uh, she got the honorable mention the following year. Uh, Robertina Shebjenic uh, hooks up uh, biochemical systems to sound. She extracts data from it, data turns into sound, she plays back to it. So she plays back with a biochemical system. This is a huge tank of jellyfish. Robertina got a double uh, mention from Ars Electronica and uh, she has been a resident last year or year. Uh, it goes on like this. This is, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Peter Weibel inviting us to do a... Um, uh, again, a video, I beg your pardon, sorry. Let me try again. Uh, Peter Weibel uh, again inviting us to take over ZKM as a weekend residency and here uh, it's a neurofeedback uh, interacting with NASA uh, space data uh, of uh, the relationships between planets which we had created a simulator for the on the previous lab so all of the work gets carried over and amplified and in different ways in the following uh, following labs and it has generative music that was written specially for it so it's uh, an ongoing symphony that is uh, really beautiful when you're in immersed in that environment when you listen to the music there that's been generated through those multiple uh, interactions of complex systems it's uh, a very beautiful thing to to listen to and also makes us uh, interact with the with the device in a very different way because what we know we are interacting with or what our um, what we are telling ourselves is that we are interacting with a very big system out there, so there's a different sense, different way to interact with something that's at that, that grand scale. Social impact, uh, we, this is uh, Israel and Palestine on stage in Berlin. In 2016, when there were all the problems with immigration, we had to get special uh, visa for Ahmad. Uh, we have a Palestinian uh, following, as a result, they all wear our T-shirts. Um, when I was, uh, when the European Commission sent me to advise to uh, to uh, uh, to the Brazilian government and uh, forge an uh, alliance uh, with um, uh, the Alliance of Internet of Things Innovation that I helped found in the Euro in Europe, I actually uh, figured that uh, one of the ways in which we could get uh, children out of vulnerability areas and there are huge amounts in Brazil, the whole of uh, Sao Paulo perimeter is children in vulnerability areas. Um, they get taught to play musical instruments. All the kids from the favelas are taught to play uh, musical instruments to get them out, to get them on a different footing. And I said, if we add to this instrument making, um, uh, electronics and engineering in uh, ten years' time, you will have a generation of engineers. And they totally, totally went for it. Um, this is a, a, chi a child after three, uh, just three hours, of uh, learning how to how to create her own sounds. So this is a, a, a child having built the whole thing from scratch, being taught after three hours. And then the parents come to us and say, how did you do this? I, my, my child didn't want to touch computers or engineering before, and now they want to be computer scientists. This is one of our latest DJs. This is from, uh, from Stockholm. So it spans all kinds of generations. We have three to 83 at the moment uh, in our 7,000 plus people. This is very important, the transdisciplinary research. This was the uh, manifesto that was created for us uh, in Cambridge MA. And uh, uh, with some, I don't know if you can read them, but uh, uh, this was initiated by Nancy Bain from Microsoft Research and Jonathan Stern, who is the author of the history of the MP3, and invited all of these people, ins including Georgina Bourne. And the m moment this m uh, manifesto was, was uh, at draft form, we flew back, we flew directly to Luxembourg to the creative unit and went, there you go, this is uh, what the international community think this should be. Uh, and at that point, I can tell you for sure, this was again 2014, in 2010, 11, when I was uh, invited, no, 10, when I was invited to Brussels for the first time, the list in the creative industries went broadcasting, gaming, publishing, there was a music at the bottom and just music, it said music. In 2014, when uh, we handed the manifesto, the list was presented music technology at the top and then it was multimedia and something else. So we had completely reversed the, the game. This uh, is responsible for a lot, there's hundreds of people signed on it. Do go online and sign it if you believe in this, uh, read it see if you believe in it and, and sign it. We also did one of the first uh, uh, blockchain white papers uh, in Berlin uh, and endless papers have been published 
uh, as part of uh, our actions, this including Music Bricks, which was not supposed to be publishing papers at all, and ended up pa publishing seven papers and two book chapters by default. Um, this was a whole system. Following that manifesto, I said, okay, we need to create a system that will help our people do better. Um, a, systems that, a system that utilizes these kinds of interfaces to generate new kinds of um, interactions with music. I had already uh, promoted the thing called Internet of Music Things, uh, which I think you find uh, now in QMUL is a topic. Um, this was the riot board that was done, um, uh, produced uh, with Aircom for this, um, that was uh, 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 reducing latency at that time, and then run them through a series of test beds, and then uh, introducing a new layer of innovation IP, so intellectual property uh, starts to be constructed in a new way. Um, this has now been accepted. Um, uh, market adoption readiness levels were in answer to technology readiness levels. So not just technology readiness, but all of these things that allow us to prototype quickly, get it quickly to market, test it, get early adopters and get new kinds of data out of the process that do not rely on that long uh, TRL process. And uh, as, as this was an innovation action, this was the uh, time to market that was so short um, that we were astonished at what was happening here, that how quickly people, people could actually come up with the first idea and then start the patenting process because those uh, toolkits were in place and because everybody knew where they stood. This is just some of the uh, people who have come out of this and the results that kept on, kept on coming. For instance, Verhaken became uh, innovator under 35 by MIT. Um, uh, they got one million follow-up funding. Uh, he did. A, he filed a patent for primary industry, from a system that was originally developed for music playlisting. And then we realized when we translated it to a system for heavy vehicles for forestry that this was like an iPhone for them. Uh, and 30 under 30 entrepreneurs in Forbes, just to name a few. Uh, accessibility breakthroughs are plenty. Lots of media coverage, uh, some absolutely wonderful things. Are all these are all part of our community? These projects. Um, again, if we can get a very short clip to work, it seems to be jamming every time we try and do a. Goodness. seems to be jamming and I think it's worth hearing him speak about it. No, it's, uh, <laughs> it's got a lovely, sp this is one of our favorite uh, bits of interaction. <laughs> I'm going to try and launch it again, because you should, you should hear it. Okay, well, I can't keep you here um, uh, waiting for a little spinning wheel, so we're going to try. No? No. Okay, let's cut that, but that's a, a wonderful accessibility project uh, that has won the International Sound Awards in... Um, September was also supported by Kota Hill Innovation. Uh, and uh, you may see a little clip if it does work later, uh, uh, it just in a minute. Uh, I put women in charge of all technology areas in our September, uh, September 2018 Stockholm event. Uh, you might recognize some of those. Um, some of them are world-class uh, professors of AI and robotics, Imogen Heap, Kelly, you might have come across, uh, and also NASA scientists, Microsoft Research, etc., BBC, and uh, as a, and also just to not to miss any of the domains that cross over in our community, Eva Kaili accepted to be a woman in the lead of politics, uh, and as a result, over 800 hands-on participants prototyping. This is the result. I have not seen one like this before. I have. It was hard work. We worked very hard to achieve this, but I have not seen a multi-gender platform in technology that has achieved 53% women. Uh, very proud of that, I must say. This is why I'm wearing our, one of our t-shirts of uh, women in uh, computing and electronic music.
which is incredibly popular uh, with our community. And then a growing ecosystem. So the impact on industry in general, and this is where uh, this is really, really important to actually understand what this community here has contributed to the whole European program. Uh, this is back in, I have, we haven't updated it, this is uh, in 2018, we had over 150 companies contributing to the space, including, you know, automotive or, I don't know, I'm looking at now, the different kind of fields, um, primary industry somewhere, and uh, semiconductor, and you name it. Um, and residences inside industry, so last year we spent one industry, in, uh, one uh, residence inside a trade fair, one inside a big industry unicorn uh, that has 64 offices around the world, and one inside an uh, AI department at university. We are doing very focused labs at the moment. And it gave birth to this uh, called the Industry Commons, which I launched with the Alliance for Internet of Things Innovation in December 2015. Uh, launched it as part of the Open Innovation Industry and Policy Group uh, with a keynote in 2017 and it's now European policy at DGRTD level and two calls already rolled out. Uh, the, the whole point was that everything we did in our projects was machine learning and of course it progressed into AI and deep learning. Um, in this space we had the exact same problems that the whole field now experiences which are you know, classically this, and this is one of the biggest bottlenecks for industry for uh, participation. And we decided that uh, we can create an industry commons based on all of our experiments and all of the things that we had uh, ex experimented with, with music bricks at a smaller scale. Um, the technology transfer toolkit of interfaces, uh, creating an IP stack, something we call the IP stack, which is how we build layers of IP in a decentralized system. And uh, this market adoption readiness, which is very much uh, Im very important for identifying emerging, emerging markets, uh, new kinds of junctions between verticals where some really exciting things are happening. This was uh, immediately fed through uh, from there, and uh, this has resulted in an Industry Commons Foundation, which I now run with some of the biggest luminaries in open innovation. It's now tasked with the legacy of long-term industry commons tools, such as kind of common ontologies and uh, different kinds of systems uh, for IP, for instance, that will allow interoperability between different industry domains. Just to finish on MTF labs, I mentioned them quite a lot. These, this is the, the level of diversity um, uh, in, in our labs, we had uh, in Stockholm, we had 90 high-level experts. I uh, invited 30. The word got round to professors and heads of uh, uh, media companies and what have you. And I was getting phone calls, and we had to accept 90 in the end because they were phenomenal people from New Zealand to Alaska. And the range of projects that came out were also amazing. I mean, the, uh, 83 people sent sound to the moon via the, uh, the Wingaloo telescope in the north of Holland, and the sound comes back reflected off the surface. It gets turned into light waves, it gets reflected uh, 2.3 seconds, it comes back to you and you hear your own uh, voice very clearly, but you hear it with the, uh, with the sound, with the disruption of the, uh, the wave as it comes back. And it's very important experience of interaction. It's not so much that you're doing breakthroughs in science here. It's about your uh, experience of the whole thing and how it inspires you to think of the next challenge after that. That's what's important. I would like you to hear it, and I really sincerely hope this uh, is going to allow me to let you hear uh, uh, in the end uh, from the people who take part. It would be very nice if this did do the trick. Shall I try and quit out and try and uh, launch it again so that we can, it will hopefully play? Because I really like you to hear what people have to say. Why do you think it's behaving like this? Do you think? Uh, yeah, I can locate the video. I would have to search for it for a second, so I just don't want you to have to wait further. So it's only a couple of minutes of really, really nice footage. Q 
keeps crashing. Let me get out of. Why don't you look for the video and take your time? Sure. Uh, there are three or four things which I find highly interesting in what you uh, presented. Yeah. I think Keynote crashed. First of all, I think what is uh, quite interesting is uh, research studios, especially data science studio, uh, had uh, been part of uh, the current project proposal from Industry Commons. And we will work with you uh, to basically make this happen in the next, uh, I would think, 14 months, uh, because there are some twists. And I want to still uh, want you to still comment on what is happening now in terms of the transformation from Horizon 2020 into Horizon Europe regarding the creative cultural industry twist, that is uh, basically the knowledge and innovation uh, initiative with within the European uh, <laughs> Institute of uh, Technology and Innovation. Something which I want to learn better and which we need to still work with you and with others is to understand this really, I mean, innovative new perspective on the work which we do and which you do regarding market adoption readiness levels. Hmm? I think we need to understand that and we need to work with and link this up to the technology transfer toolkit because there is a lot of things which uh, would be innovative within the entire, what we call the Austrian innovation system and uh, the university and uh, research uh, uh, space in Austria. And then uh, what is also, I think, interesting uh, is uh, to understand um, in terms of the transfer, what are the industry bottlenecks because I think we need to uh, be quite smart on this regard and, uh, and learn from you on that. Mm. I have a two-minute thing that's uh, now from the actual video. Does so it, does it work now? Yeah, it looks okay, like so it, so definitely. Fantastic. Thank uh, you so much. Gap Rescuing the situation. Uh, here we go. Hello, what just happened? We are now 25 meters on the ground in Sweden's first nuclear reactor, now also known as the Cathedral of Science. of different skill sets. I can speak it easily, communicate easily in this kind of environment. So the interesting thing about MTF is that every year there's a theme and we try to use that theme to help our development of that year. We chose uh, this uh, AI lab because uh, AI is uh, something that is inevitable. The first step is that AI is actually uh, a companion right for humans and company human existence. There's a, a whole bunch of different projects happening, but what I see is a number of different uh, specialists interacting, trying to speak to each other. People, you know, like creating own stuff and creating new stuff. I was like, it would be really cool to like, see what they do. What I think can be interesting is to challenge what human can already do. If it can expand our uh, boundaries of perception, if it can challenge us to be even more creative. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to see what comes out of it. 
So just to, to hear it from them, uh, I did have a photo somewhere of me receiving this Woman Innovator Award. The reason I'm mentioning it is the very, very first time that creative domain, the creative industries have been awarded in this way. You always had uh, engineering, uh, space, uh, research, science, uh, hardcore sciences. Um, and this really sets a precedent. This is also another very indicative thing that when it comes to innovation, um, this field now that we operate in has now been recognized as something that really truly contributes to, to society uh, when it comes to innovation. So this is very important. And as I say, when it comes to a range of projects, we talked about deep learning, for instance, we did polyphonic nets just um, in Orebro and residency, this AI department, we got the conservatoire students to compose music using the results of the neural networks generated polyphonic music, which is fabulous. I mean, the music that was created was so diverse and really proper compositions that are using this as one of their ex tools for expression, for instance. It's just one example. We have dance AI. We are doing a whole showcase in Frankfurt. In fact, if you're um, the Frankfurt Music Messe has, has now got us as their kind of innovation wing and we will be showcasing a whole bunch of these latest uh, projects that use all of the latest tools we discussed. Too many to show here, but anyway, just uh, we always say that we don't predict the future, we invent it. So um, thank you and thank you for your patience with our with technologies. <laughs>